All right, uh, I have started the recording. All right. So uh, first uh, announcement uh, about the quiz next, uh, next week. So our first week will be, uh, uh, our first quiz will be next week on Friday. All right. It's an online quiz, so you will have a full day, 24 hours to access it. Uh, you will have only one attempt. All right. uh, so it, it is only eight multiple choice questions, uh, 30 minutes, was 10% of uh, course scores. But remember, now don't uh, start your quiz, for example, at uh, uh, 11.40 p.m. Right? Because whether you finish or not, when the time is over, uh, uh, then it, it will, uh, the quiz will be submitted. All right? So start as early as possible. Don't wait, wait to do the quiz in the last minute. The contents of the quiz will cover uh, those taught in the first three weeks. Uh, and uh, that include some exercise, uh, the conjoint exercise uh, in week four tutorial, because week four tutorial is uh, a part of it. It's just uh, exercising uh, what we uh, teach today in week three. Uh, so all the uh, required contents, uh, uh, not the optional ones, Right. And the required contents, uh, including uh, the uh, video recordings on the binary logistic regression, right? uh, other readings on, on Moodle, as long as it does, does not say this is optional, now these contents are all required. Right. Uh, in some questions, you will be asked to use uh, Excel adding, uh, the real stats adding, to perform some analysis. Right. So make sure that you uh, install the software correctly. If uh, I, I know for some, some students, your laptop or P PC may not be stable uh, with, with uh, this adding. Now, in, in that case, I would recommend that you do your quiz in our computer lab. I right. uh, go to computer lab, find a PC, make sure uh, your software is installed and I'll check everything fine. Maybe do some exercise from our tutorial material, right? And then you start your, uh, your quiz. So uh, to minimize the chance that you will encounter some problem um, during the quiz. And uh, when, when it's time, uh, you will find the quiz on Moodle under the assessment instructions and the submission part. Uh, we have a question say, does that mean we do not have to use R for, for the quiz? Uh, that is correct. Uh, R is a very useful software, uh, but uh, given the scope of our, of our course, now this is not a programming course, so we will not uh, teach you extensively on how to uh, write a code in R. And I promise that, that uh, when I ask you to do our stuff, I will give you code. Right? Uh, you just need to modify this. And I, I thought, no, um, it does not make a lot of sense. Now, when you do quiz, I give you all the code. You just uh, click a button and give me the result. Right? So that, that does not make a lot, a lot of sense. So uh, let's say we don't use, uh, uh, don't do R in our quiz. Right? But uh, uh, during your team project, you will find the, uh, that R is very handy when you do a lot of analysis, you do very complicated analysis. R is uh, uh, a great tool. Another question is, would well, you mind giving us an example of questions? Uh, it's, uh, they are all multiple choice questions, right? Um, so uh, so some, something, uh, something like, uh, uh, the, given this, uh, the, uh, 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 the, given the co context of uh, uh, a business, business problem, uh, now which re regression do you think is uh, uh, good? I uh, and uh, um, maybe now after you perform some analysis, I will ask you to read the uh, result and uh, tell tell me you now what kind of insights you will draw from uh, the, the results. Um, and of course, now this, uh, they are all multiple choice questions. So the options will be given. You just uh, need to pick the one that best match or answers the, the question. Uh, 
right? Any other questions? Don't worry too much. Uh, uh, once uh, once you uh, do do the fir first one, now uh, you will, you will find it's not not uh, difficult. Right? So you uh, as long as you have a good understanding of uh, the contents taught in the course, you should be fine. Right? And uh, it will, uh, the format will be the same for quiz two and the final exam. Right? Uh, don't don't worry. Uh, no, I in, in my in my course now I. Uh, the f the fail rate is not not high. Uh, uh, I'm, I I think uh, yeah it should be uh, around the university average or or lower. Right? It's not the, that my course involves uh, math, so it's more likely you will uh, fail. Not 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 that. Uh, so the final exam is also in multiple choice questions. That's another question. Yes, it is in uh, using multiple choice questions. Right. But uh, don't uh, don't get it wrong. Now, multiple choice questions is uh, can be designed in uh, many different ways. Right. It's not that uh, uh, with multiple choice questions then you don't need to uh, think too much. That's not totally not true. Right. Uh, I I designed all the multiple choice questions myself. Right. I did not copy it from some uh, question bank. So. Uh, it's not not like uh, uh, no uh, very uh, so, so I would I not do not attest to your memory uh, memorizing what I said right all my questions require your understanding and your thoughts right, to uh, uh, of the contents so uh, be prepared and I don't think it's multiple choice questions so it's memorized no that's not not the case. Uh, the final exam. Final exam is during the uh, exam period. Now, the time will be determined by the uh, exam timetable team, not not me, because it's final exam. Although it's uh, online now, but the time will be determined by the uh, university team. Any other questions? All right. If uh, uh, we are good, let's move on to today's topic. Conjoint analysis. Right. So uh, last week we talked about using um, some sort of survey, or now you can think about it as a scanner data, right? So you have some uh, product you observe at a different price, now with different brand, uh, different weight. How uh, how consumer will buy for them? Right? Uh, how much they would like to pay? Whether they will choose it or not? Right? Uh, so. That works for uh, a product with very simple features, like uh, coffee. Right? We only have uh, like two features last time, weight and the brand. But the real world is much more complex. When we want to design a new product uh, from scratch, right? and let's say this uh, product has uh, uh, quite a few features, right? and for each feature there could be uh, some feature levels. Right? For example, we are going to use a pizza uh, in, uh, in this session. So pizza, let's say topping. Topping is a feature, right? But topping ha can have uh, many different feature levels. You can have uh, pepperoni, you can have uh, pineapple, you can have ve veggie. Now, all these, right? uh, they, they becomes a quite complex, complicated problem. And when you deal with a problem like that, how are you going to design your product based on consumer's preference, based on people's value for these product features and feature, feature levels? And the tool we are going to talk about is uh, conjoint analysis. But uh, before we actually uh, get to the tool, we first uh, want to talk about the problem a, li a little bit more. Right? That's how I arrange this course. Each session, we are going to talk about a marketing problem. And for that marketing problem, how are we going to use analytical tools to help us uh, solve that problem? So design a product uh, based on consumer preferences. So in the, a good design of product is very, very, very important. I, uh, it's, it, uh, how important? So this uh, there's a study from McKinsey uh, says now 
80% of products manufacturing cost are determined during the first 20% of its design. It's, uh, it's not that uh, these manufacturing costs are caused at that time, but it's determined as long as your design has fixed I and mean, you have to do all these uh, manufacturing costs. Right. So that is just on the cost side, but how about the success? Another study uh, by Robert Cooper, uh, it's an old study, but a very extensive one. So this uh, study studied the 203 B2B products. And uh, uh, they gave an index based on uh, the, these four questions right, uh, to determine how successful they are. That include you now whether they meet the uh, manager, management criteria for success, how pro profitable it is, uh, what's the market share at the end of three years, and whether it meets the sales and the project, uh, profit objectives. Right. So based on these four check, uh, questions, they uh, pull some success score, right? the higher the better. Right? So they're interested to find out which one is uh, uh, more powerful success driver. Is it uh, that uh, uh, I'm in the right market? Uh, this market is very attractive to, to us. Uh, is, it, uh, is that an important factor? Um, now the other thing is uh, product superiority. So whether my product is a very good one, right? Uh, apparently, you no. Know, both factors should be important, right? But the question here is, which one is a more powerful driver for success? So first, uh, let's look at the market attractiveness. Uh, so it, basically, you are in the right market, right? in the right market, and it appear, uh, appears to be uh, very important. So when uh, we talk about the success rate from zero to 100%, uh, um, in a low level of market attractiveness, you know, in a bad market, uh, the, uh, the success rate is 42.5. And it, uh, it increased to 61 when it's moderate attractive, uh, and it increased to almost 74%. Uh, that's a very high chance of success, right? Uh, in a, high attractive market. And you can see now uh, we care about market share, right? How, what percentage of market share can you uh, occupy? And uh, you can see you now the market share also increases steadily when the market becomes more attractive. So being an attractive market is very important. But how about the product superiority? It's even more important. So when the product superiority is minimum, the a success rate is only 18%. Right? When it's moderate, 5.5, five, five, no, no, about half, right? 58%. But when it's maximum, uh, it's almost a guaranteed successful. And the market share difference, you can see now last time there are only 2% difference between the three levels, right? But this time it's about 20% difference in terms of uh, uh, you know, the, uh, through the among the three levels. So minimum market share is only 11%, but the moderate, you can increase to 32%, and the maximum, you can get more than half of the market share. So uh, from, from here, you can see, you now being in the right market is very important, but having a great product is uh, the key to the success almost a guaranteed success. So how to design a new product? We know it's important, so how do we design it? Uh, in, for a very long time, uh, in the past, we uh, worked like this. So engineer says, no, I have a great idea. I can uh, make something great. So I have a new product, right? So I make it. Then your marketers are responsible for selling the new product. That's, that was a model, and uh, that's still uh, in many of our uh, us minds. However, the world has uh, changed a lot, actually. Uh, the thing becomes much, much more complicated. Right? So uh, re remember, in the first session, we talked about the history of marketing. Right? So the other way is indeed the product-centered view of how we do business. Right? But now we have shifted in customer-focused or even customer relationship-focused 
uh, view of how we do business. Right? So in that uh, uh, background, when we design a product, we first need to find, uh, when, even at the early stage of identify opportunities, uh, marketing start to play a role. Right? We go to market and find out, uh, is there any opportunity? Can we find some idea from the market? Right? Uh, instead of engineers saying, no, what I can make, now, now we ask a question, now, what is needed in the market? Okay? We produce the product based on what is needed rather than what we can make. Right? Because now, nowadays, uh, uh, we can virtually produce anything we uh, can think of, right? Then uh, the question is which one uh, can make, a, make us some profit, which one is needed in the market. Right? So the first step involves marketing. Then when we design the product, you can see you know, only engineering uh, only play a small part, even in the design stage. Right? We need to uh, think of other things like uh, how we're going to position this uh, uh, pro uh, no, no, first I clarify customer needs, right? And then how are we going to pr uh, position this product? And among all the, the entire population, which segment should we target? Right? And each segment have different needs, right? And how are we going to uh, arrange sales force? Uh, uh, how, how can we uh, predict the sales? And how are we going to achieve the sales target using marketing mix? Uh, tool, tools. So you can see when we design the product, we can we think all these things we are going to do in marketing, right? and the engineer only play a small part of role. Uh, and after we have a design, it's not the end of story. Right? We uh, we keep on testing at a different stage. First, we test it in, in a small uh, market, for example. Right? Uh, then, then maybe we initially launch it in a, a limited area. After all these tests we give us confidence, we start to launch it in the entire population. Right? And during this stage, anytime marketing says, no, there's some problem, we need to rethink. For example, you know, when the idea has uh, some problem, may not have market potential, we go back and keep on finding new ideas. During all this procedure, we went the design, um, design stage, testing stage, launch stage, we find the issues. We go back and rethink whether we should redesign this product or reposition it. Right? And even after we launch the product, we manage the product life cycle because uh, once a product is launched, you know, there will be other new product. Right? So there's a, a product life cycle. It's a launch stage, mature stage, harvest stage, and uh, later, later uh, stage that may need to go phase out the, the market. So this entire life cycle man management, um, if we are lucky enough, we got the harvest value. Right? That's what you see. In order to get make some money in the uh, in our days, the procedure is much much more complicated than before. Right? And sometimes we need to reposition our product. Right? And uh, uh, a good example of repositioning uh, is uh, medicine called the Viagra. Right? Uh, I I, th I think this is a very popular. Uh, no, not very popular, very famous, <laughs> very famous ca case. So, you know, Viagra was, uh, I'm not sure if you know that uh, Viagra was initially uh, designed to treat uh, hypertension. Right? That is uh, high pressure in your uh, bl blood pressure. Right? And then they discovered this side effect right, to uh, treat uh, this erectile dysfunction. And then later they find it. So initially going through this procedure, now they were targeting those people have hypertension. Right? But then they realized that during this uh, initial launch, during the life cycle management, they find that the side effect of this medicine right, is more profitable. So they, so no, no, in that case, why do we reposition it? So they reposition the product to deal with erectile dysfunction and make a, a huge amount of money out of that product. Right? So um, 
Initially, it was a side effect, but now the side effect is the main uh, setting point for the product. So that is an example. Uh, market drives uh, what we do in a firm, right? So market size, the uh, side effect is more profitable. We do that in a firm. So um, the key research question, right? we start to form this habit, right? We have a problem, say, can we uh, design a good product? Right? And then you need to break that down into some research questions, right? Research question here, I think the major one is, the, uh, if I want to uh, create a product, what is the consumer's preference? For this market, now uh, for this product, uh, the product have different feature, feature levels, right? What are consumers' preference for this feature and feature levels? And that uh, also is that question is also asked uh, given a context you know, among the existing products on the market, right? because no product is without the competitors, right? So you need to think about the given what is. Uh, available on the market. If I design a new product, what is customer's preference? How they like each product feature and feature levels. So let's see uh, uh, example. It is frozen pizza design, uh, frozen pizza. Um, here we have uh, uh, to make the uh, Example a bit easier. Now, pizza have more features than five, right? But we only talk about five features, and they have a lot of feature levels. So we assume uh, this is uh, what we are going to have uh, a simplified case. So we have uh, five features called the type of crust, uh, topping, type of cheese, amount of cheese, and the price. Five levels, and for each one, we make a simple say crust. There's a three levels, right? pan crust, thin crust, and a thick crust. Uh, for toppings, we have four levels, pineapple, veggie, sausage, and uh, pepperoni. Type of cheese, Old English, natural Swiss, mozzarella. Uh, amount of cheese, a little, says so 50 gram, a lot, three times, 150 kilogram. Price, uh, instead of putting it as a continuous, we say now we only have three levels of price. It's $7.99, $8.99, and $9.99. Actually, this uh, happens a lot in the real life, right? We do not try to make uh, 100 different prices to confuse uh, consumers. Right? We make it a bit simple, saying that we have, uh, for example, three, type, uh, three levels of price, uh, the cheap one, medium, and high one, right? Uh, and despite uh, you have choose different combinations, now you always only uh, have three levels of price, and that makes sense in the real life. So our question is to research question again, you know, try to find out how much people like each of the feature and the feature levels. That's what we are going to achieve use, using research method. Right? So uh, the total product space, now if we uh, say no, this, even this simple example, if we make different uh, combinations of pizza, we can make a 216 different pizza out of this product space. Right? So that is uh, three class level, levels times four topping times uh, three uh, type of cheese, then two levels of amount of cheese and uh, three levels of prices. Right? We can have 216 pizza in all. Right? So one way to study this, now you can make this 216 pizza and ask everyone. Right? Uh, for everyone, you show them this 216 pizza and uh, see what, which one they will choose. Right? That will be a huge, huge amount of task. But we are smarter than that. Right? So we are going to uh, use some tools. But before we uh, start, I'd like you to make a choice. Right? Uh, so you can go to this link. I'm sure you downloaded my uh, slides. So go to your slides, you can click on the link. Right? So this will get, get you to a web, website, uh, a web, web page you, where you can pick among these four pieces. Right? And I, I would like you to remember your choice uh, later. After you um, complete some, other, uh, some 
st uh, st uh, study questions, right? uh, you can try to use these answers to the questions to predict which pizza you actually choose. Right? See if your uh, analysis actually can correctly predict what you, you choose over here. So you can choose on, on the website right? uh, and, and also make, uh, write, write it down, uh, make a note. Uh, I will give you one more minute to do that. Have you made your choice? All right, uh, we will move on. All right. So before we actually do uh, introduce our tools, we first uh, have some background theory. Right? It's called the decision rules. Decision rules is about how consumers make decisions. Right? So we need to have a theory to help us form our uh, uh, analytical tools, right? And the uh, decision rule is, is one of the uh, backbones. So uh, there could be various of uh, decision rules. Sometimes it can be comp uh, can compensatory, compensatory. Uh, for example, now I will pay $9.99, a high price right, for sausage or pepperoni pizza because I love meat, for example, right? Uh, but I will pay a lower price for pineapple or veg pizza. So, so in, in this case, I assume that the, all these toppings are acceptable, but it's just that I like some more than other. So if, me, if you want me to choose the one that I, I like less, no, uh, you should charge me less. That's, so that's a logic. That's why we call it, it, call it compensatory. So basically when the, uh, we talk about compensatory rules, we are making trade-off. So there's a decision between uh, higher quality, high price, and no low quality, low price, something you like, you pay more, something you like less, you pay less, something like that. That's called the compensatory rules. And there could be non-compensatory rules, right? something I definitely have to have or have, uh, I definitely would not have. Example, right? conjunctive rules. So this is uh, something I must have, right? I must have crossed and a lot of cheese. It can be disjunctive. So I can have either sausage topping or thin crust, but other things I don't want, right? So uh, it's just a different type of na names, but show, showing you, you know, what kind of possibility uh, we have when people make rule, uh, uh, make decisions, what kind of possible rules they can have. Right? So the last example is uh, like circle graphic. Say, you no, know, I will first think about the topping. It must be veggie, uh, veggie or pepperoni. Then I will think about type of cheese. It needs to be mozzarella, things like that. Right? So uh, this is not an exhaustive list. I'm just listing the typical three. It can, it can be a long list. For example, some uh, times we have disjunctive of conjunction rules or conjunction rules of disjunction rules can be very complicated, right? So these decision rules are embedded in uh, people's uh, de decisions. It's our job to find them out, right? Uh, target of analyzing people's uh, decision data is try to find out their decision rules. So in order to get how much people like a piece of features and feature levels. And we can have various different ways. That was the first way, you now ask them direct questions. We do that when we talk about you know, depth interview. Right? We have a folks group, for example. Uh, then in that, those cases, those research methods, you can directly ask people. And here I'm trying to compare a few different ways right? um, so that you know the pros and the cons of different ways to find out the customer preference. Right? The first and the most straightforward way is uh, a direct question. Right? You can directly talk to people. 
So what is the pros and cons of directly asking people? It is easy to conduct, right? Uh, you just talk to people. <laughs> uh, and it has the ability, that's the best part. It has the ability to explore unknown to certain rules. Right? Or uh, as a method, when you talk about model, when you talk about quantitative method, as soon as you set up a model, you have already made some decisions, uh, make some assumptions of how people make decisions. But when we, you talk to people, you ask them, it's an exploratory research method. You don't have a priorly set uh, decision rules that you assume people will use. Right? So it, it, it's good to discover unknown decision rules. However, it is not a systematic. Right? Think about this uh, very simple PISA problem. Right? You only have five features and you know, uh, that will lead to like 216 pieces, right? Are you, do you plan to ask them all these 216 pieces? Are you going to ask them you now for each feature and a feature levels, how much people like it? Uh, are you going to ask like 20, 30 questions uh, all together? And that's just uh, the feature, feature levels, right? When we talk about the trade-off, Say now, how are you going to use uh, now? Say for example, for pepperoni pizza, would you like to pay high or low? For veggie pizza, you would, would like to pay more or less. And is there anything you definitely don't accept? Things you definitely have to have. All kind of this leads to a huge number of questions, particularly when you try to accommodate. Uh, trade-offs, right? Uh, that uh, possibility will be endless. Right? You cannot, it's not simply not possible to ask a person all these questions. Right? And when you get the result, you need to turn that into prediction. That is hard. Right? That is hard. Uh, so e easy to ask people, but hard to use a, use a result. That's why we typically use uh, direct questions in depth interview, right? When we try to explore the problem and uh, use more quantitative method after we uh, finish the exploration, after we have a good understanding of how people will make decisions when they choose pizza, right? Then we use more quantitative method to get people's decision rules. And a case map is such a, uh, such a method. Case, a case map, uh, um, believe it or not, it, it was uh, popular for a very long time uh, before conjoint was developed. Let's see uh, the logic of case map. Case map first uh, uh, have uh, five basic steps. There will be variations, but these uh, five essential steps. Right? So the first uh, now show the unacceptable feature levels. Among all these feature levels, which ones are not acceptable? Right? Then among those acceptables, what is your most preferred? And uh, uh, what is the least preferred? Then select uh, the most important feature. Now, minus the difference here, sometimes I talk about feature levels, sometimes I talk about features. Right? So the step three is select the critical features. Right? Then the uh, given the critical feature, let's say you rate it with a rating 10, with a rating 10, then you state the importance for other features. Each of the feature, now the most important let's say is 10, then uh, given that, how are you going to rate the importance of other features, right? Then after that, uh, you have already told me your most preferred and the least preferred feature levels, right? So let's assume the most preferred feature is, should be rated as 10, least as one or zero, doesn't really matter. Um, how are you going to rate all feature levels? All feature levels. So at the end of the day, you will have the importance rating for each features and the importance rating for each feature levels. Now, 
uh, you can think about this, right? So the, for each feature and the feature uh, levels, you know the importance. So now if I give you a pizza, you can calculate by using the importance of feature and the feature levels. You can, can calculate the number, right? And uh, let's assume that number is how much people like this pizza. Then as long as you finish this case map procedure, given any sorts of pizza, uh, you can estimate people's rating for that pizza. And that indeed is what the case map does. I have created a study website for you uh, to give it a try, give it a try. Uh, we don't have time to go through in the, in the lecture, but you can uh, experience uh, this, uh, this procedure uh, by going to this web page and try it yourself. And during this procedure, I want you to think, you know, uh, because you are a researcher now, right? Uh, so when you answer this qu question, try to think. Now, if I, uh, when I ans give answers to these questions, uh, does that, uh, how well does that represent my true preference for pizza? If they get this uh, rating, do you think they will have a good prediction of what I really think about pizza or not? Uh, given the fact that uh, it has been used for a long time, it uh, uh, of course have some merit, of course. Right? That, that is uh, true, but it also have some problems. I want you to experience that right? after class. But now uh, given this uh, uh, logic, uh, what is uh, pros and cons? Right? So uh, since case map is uh, not our mo major focus in the uh, course, so I will uh, keep it brief. I directly go to the pros and cons. Right. So uh, good thing, systematic. Right. So instead of asking pe people a lot of questions, uh, you ask them to give one number to each feature and the feature levels. Right. That's a lot easier than us asking people a huge number of questions. Right. Systematic, you do not miss any feature or feature levels. Right. Easy to use the result, just as I described. Right. After you get the answer, wherever you have a new, a new product, a new pizza, I can estimate uh, how much this person like uh, this pizza right, by calculating, multiply their importance. Right. However, this task is, uh, task is not natural. What is natural? Natural here, <coughs> excuse me. Here natural means is how people make real decisions in their life. If your study task matches how people make decisions in their life, it's called a natural. If not, it's called a not natural. And for case map, it's clearly not natural. Because when we buy a pizza, I don't know you guys, uh, at, le at least where I buy a pizza, although I'm, I, uh, I'm pretty good at math, I never assign some scores to each piece of, piece of, uh, feature and the feature levels and I calculate you know, well, how much it works for me. Uh, each piece, of the amount, all these pieces, I get the one uh, that have the highest rating for me. I never did that. Even I'm good at math, all right? No, nobody did do that uh, to the best of my knowledge. Um, that's not natural. We do not make decisions in that, in that way. Moreover, this makes a strong assumption. Right? Uh, since you have already uh, no linear regression, right? So this is basically an uh, assumption that people make uh, pizza decisions and uh, they treat uh, all acceptable pizza features as a linear relationship. Right? I, for each feature, I get a rating times the importance of that feature. I get a score for that feature. And all scores, they add up to be the total, total, total score. And that is a very strong assumption. What if this relationship is not linear, right? uh, non-linear, non like a curve? Right? Uh, then 
when this assumption is violated, your result will get wrong. Get wrong. Uh, so in order to avoid the problems with case map, now conjunct analysis was used. Um, in conjunct analysis, it tried to make the study task nat more natural by asking people to rate or choose among a set of products instead of break the product down and rate each feature and feature levels. They show people, hey, here's uh, three pizza. Here's three pizza. Which one do you like best? This is called a choice based accounting task. Right? Or no, in our example, now I gave you a pizza. Can you tell me how much you like it? You can still use rating. Right? You can rate it from zero to 100. Right? But uh, that rating is not based on the calculation of feature and feature levels. It's based on your overall feelings of this one entire pizza. Then you can ask people to, or you can uh, do some ranking, right? Here is five pizza uh, among these five, which do you like best? Which do you like second best? Which like third best? Right? Uh, that compared to case map is a lot more natural. Right? But the thing is that after you get people's answer, uh, you it's hard for you to break that answer down into uh, how much people like each feature and feature levels, right? In the end, we want that in order to uh, be able to design our new product. So how do we get these people's preference for feature and feature levels? Right? Instead of asking people like the case map, conjunct analysis says, now after I observe your answers in your conjunct study, I can estimate, I do not ask you, I estimate your value or your utility, right? Or the, there's a, a term in content called the pot worth, that is uh, people's utility for each feature levels, right? So I estimate their value or utility or pot worth for the product feature and the feature levels. So uh, here is a, a conjunct research tool. Uh, you can give it a try. Uh, online. But I will give you another example based on PISA. But this uh, we website uh, basically allows you to design more complicated uh, corner studies. And uh, uh, I, uh, I think they even allow you to collect, uh, I give you some free cre credit to collect some data right? and you can analyze those. Uh, so if you're interested, you can give it a try. It is optional. So this is an example of rating based on so I, uh, instead of ask you to evaluate all 216 possible pieces, I don't have to do that. Uh, I only need 16 pieces. I give you the 16 pieces here. You tell me for each piece, what is your rating? Based on that, I will estimate how much you like for each feature levels, for example, how much you like of the pan crust, how much you like a pie, a pineapple as toppings, right? using regression, right? the tool we just uh, used uh, in the last uh, last session. Right? So uh, first, give it a try. Right? Give it a try uh, again. Use the link here. Uh, after you go to link, you will be asked to rate all these sixteen pizza and uh, you can try to uh, write your answer down write your answer down as well so uh, put that in the excel i give you uh, if you don't know just uh, first uh, uh, put, put down the answer answers and uh, we can uh, use the answers to estimate the part words or the utility for each feature levels right? so i will first uh, give you uh, five minutes to do that. Um, then we'll come back and estimate the part words. So do, when, when we are doing this, uh, actually, uh, let me give you a couple more minutes. Uh, if you need a break, please also feel free to uh, use this opportunity 
as uh, as a break. We will come back in about uh, about uh, uh, seven or eight minutes. All right. Uh, have Have you all done with the uh, conjoint study? Uh, in In the chat, chat, uh, we have uh, a very good question. Uh, it's a good observation. Right? Uh, uh, in, indeed, I like the uh, careful observation here. So, uh, uh, question is uh, bundle two and uh, four. Right? There is a setting uh, pretty different, uh, but the price, uh, the setting is the same, uh, the price are different. And you, you can see sometimes the price and some settings are the same, but one of the feature is different. And, uh, uh, and the th thanks uh, uh, Cam Cameron uh, for, for answer the question for me. Uh, and, that, and the answer is indeed correct. Uh, when we set other features to be the same and one feature different, we can evaluate you know, uh, how people see that uh, difference in the feature uh, by looking at their difference in ratings. Right? We can get a sense of the, uh, how much this difference in the feature level matters to, to this particular person. Right? Right. So uh, good question, good answer. Let's uh, try uh, to analyze, right? After we get the, the data, we are going to analyze them. But before that, I'd like to have a comparison uh, between conjunct and other, other uh, methods, right? discuss the pros and cons. Uh, as you can, uh, as you have not experienced, <laughs> this is a systematic way. Right? Later, after we estimate all the Patterns uh, for the feature feature levels. You will know that this is indeed a systematic. But so so far, you just evaluate the sixteen PISA. Right? It seems uh, not a systematic, but it indeed is. It's a more natural decision task right? uh, compared to case map and uh, direct question. This is more like how we make decisions. And among content analysis, there are also some difference, right? Rating is less natural. Uh, a choice task is more natural. Right? Choice is among these three pizza. Right? In the last few slides, I do have that example for you. Uh, so among the three pizza, which one would you like to choose to buy or not, not buy? Right? So that is, matches our uh, natural decision making more. However, that will require multinomial logistic regression for you to analyze those data. Right? So uh, this is not uh, required in this course. So for the ease of your analysis, I gave you the rating-based uh, content analysis. Right? So you have a continuous dependent variable. It's easier for you to model that using regression. Um, it accommodates various decision rules without making major dis assumptions. Unlike case map, where when you do the task in case map, your dis the way you dis make decision has already been assumed and implemented in the case map method. Each feature and feature level you gave importance, rating, right? You cannot do other things, but just I gave a rating. However, in a counter analysis, you tell me your overall feeling of a product profile or bundle, right? Uh, basically a product. You look at the entire product and tell me how much you like it, what do you think about it? Then I did not ask you how you make that decision. It is up to me to find out your decision rules using the data you gave me. So all your decision rules, whether compensatory or non-compensatory, whether rule A or rule B, they're all embedded in the data. If you're good enough to design a model to find out that decision rules, 
hey, here you go to uh, find the right decision rules, right? Uh, so it does not make a lot of assumptions. The decision rules has been embedded in the data for you to discover. Easy to use the result. I, the, after you get the password estimation, you will find the use of the uh, result is the same as, uh, uh, as easy as case map, just a calculate. And uh, it's, one drawback is may not be easy to an analyze. Right now, uh, after you take this course, this, you should cross that, uh, the, this point. Right? Because, uh, well, once we study this, uh, we can do it, no problem. I have a question here. Um, do different types of survey designs uh, change how much thought people are willing to give to the options? I can imagine uh, having sliders make a comparison of ratings easier, or maybe that over correct or how people would usually just make decisions and give a menu. I think this is a, a very good question. Uh, by Kim Chen. Um, that's absolutely true. Uh, the way you ask a question uh, matters a lot. Right? If you help uh, uh, pe people make their decisions more natural, uh, you are going to get a better understanding of their decision rules. If you make the task easier for them to complete, they will be uh, happier to do the study for you and uh, spend less effort struggling with the format of the questions, but uh, give more thoughts to the uh, things that you really want them to put attention on that. Right? So designing the questions, designing the su survey is uh, very important. We should learn that uh, through some marketing research course, uh, how to better design your study in order to achieve the most accurate result. Right? It is a, a, a very good and a big, big question. Right. So uh, here for simplicity reasons, I just uh, give you this one way of uh, providing ratings to each uh, bundle. And uh, now on, honestly, the looking at the, the 16 pieces all together is about a, a bit tiresome, right? Uh, it may, uh, may help for, us to give you, for example, each pizza at one page for you to rate that, make, make people you know, feel better when they uh, do the study. These are all possible ways you can improve um, content, a content study. You know, this is a very good question. Um, now we get the data, we are going to estimate them. Right. To estimate that, we first need to see some uh, formula. I, ho I hope you like formula. <laughs> if you do, you are going to love these slides. Uh, so uh, uh, this is basically uh, our model. Right? We say people's utility. And in this case, in the study we just uh, completed, this utility is people's rating, right? People's rating. That's a dependent variable we have, we know. And here X, X is product of features, right? We know product features, we know their ratings. What we try to estimate are the betas. And the, the betas, they are the utility associated with a certain feature level, right? So that is beta IG. Let's say P is a particular product. Right. And the, utility, the UP is a utility with, associated with this product. We have M numbers of features. In this piece of example, M equals to five, right. five features. And for e each fe feature, there are different feature levels, right? Uh, so KI is a number of levels in the ice feature. For example, if uh, we are talking about the price feature, then this K, for price has three levels, three levels, right? Um, uh, it's 7, 99, 8, 99, and 999, three levels. And the XIJ is a composition of uh, J's level uh, of the ice feature. 
right, for product P. And the beta is the utility or the path worth we try to estimate, beta ij here. Right? That is a path worth. And uh, uh, to capture, uh, capture the, uh, the rest of the effect that is not captured by the product, we have uh, intercept, right? beta zero, beta zero here, and some error term. That is what this equation is about. Uh, the middle part may look scary, but if you break it down, it's actually straightforward. It's just an elegant way to summarize a long equation. Right? So if we break it down, it should be look like this. Uh, so beta zero is the intercept. Then uh, we have uh, for feature one, we have a level no, x11, x12, x1k1. Right? K1 is the number of feature uh, a number of feature levels for feature one. And for each feature level, we have a path worth, beta one one, beta one two, through beta one k one. So that's the first feature. Then we have the second feature. Then we have the M's feature, right? The middle part all add up together, it basically write in such a way. Right? So very elegant. Uh, Elegant equation. Right. So now another uh, tool, uh, another thing we need to talk about is uh, dummy variable. Right. In, because in this case, we are going to use dummy variable to represent product features. For example, a two level feature, this uh, amount of cheese. We have only two levels, a little cheese and a lot of cheese. A dummy variable is something like that here. Now the dummy variable name is amount, a lot. Right? And this dummy variable equals to one if the product feature is a lot of cheese and equal to zero if it's a little bit cheese. Right? So this is this, uh, this line here, amount lot equals to one if uh, the product has a lot of cheese, otherwise zero. This is how we design, uh, de define this dummy variable. And in this dummy variable, the one with zero, we call it the baseline as a base. So for two level feature, we use one dummy variable to represent this feature. If this dummy variable is zero, it says no, hey, this uh, pizza has a baseline feature called a little bit cheese. If this dummy variable is one, we say, no, this pizza have a lot of cheese, right? So just using one variable, we are able to represent these two level features, all right? This is the simplest way, two level features. How about the three level features? Now with three level features, we are going to use two dummy variables. Still, we need to have a baseline. Here, I, I choose the pan crust as a baseline. You don't have to, you can choose anyone as a baseline. Right? But let's say pan crust is a baseline. Then we have two dummy variables. Cross a thin equals to one if the product has a thin crust. Otherwise, in all other cases, including if it's pan crust or it's thick crust, this dummy variable cross a thin always equals to zero unless now the product has a thin crust. So from this table, you can see it only have value one if it's thin crust. In all other cases, it have zero. The second dummy variable, crust thick, it e equals to one only if the product has a thick crust. In all other cases, it have zero value, right? So using this, two dummy variables, we are able to represent all the three levels for crust. Here's the table. If we have a pan crust, what we should see from these two dummy variables are zero and a zero. If it's a thin crust, we should see a, a one and a zero. If it's a thick crust, have zero and a one. All right? So the same thing, right? If we have four levels, we have uh, three 
dummy variables. We also have a baseline here. Pi apple is a baseline, now zero, 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 right? And for each dummy variable, it's defined as, for the top of veggie is, if the topping is veggie, it's one. In all other cases, zero. Topping sausage, when sauce, to, the topping is indeed sausage, right? it's one, otherwise it's zero. Topping pepperoni, it's one when the topping is pepperoni. In all other cases, zero. In that way, we represent all four possible levels. When it's pineapple, all zero. When veggie, it's one, zero, zero. When it's sausage, it's zero, one, zero. Pepperoni, zero, zero, one. Okay. So that's how we define a, a, a dummy variable. We, the number of dummy variable we have is always one level less than the number of levels we are interested. For example, we're interested four level. Now we have three dummy variables. We're interested in uh, five levels, four dummy variables, right? Now, uh, how do we interpret? If we find, for example, the coefficient in front of this dummy variable, let's say amount of cheese a lot, uh, a lot. If the beta in front of it is, uh, let's say, five, how do we interpret? Does it does it mean that a lot of cheese have a part worth five? No. Right. For when you use dummy variables, this should. Uh, uh, you should be a bit careful with that. When you interpret the coefficient for the dummy variable, it is always against the baseline. All right. So uh, the beta in front of a lot of cheese, right, it was compared to the baseline, which is a little amount of cheese. Right, compared to a little amount of cheese. When you have a lot of cheese, then people's evaluation, their path was, is five more than the baseline. Five more than the baseline. Similarly, similarly when this, uh, we, we talk about the crust, right? So let's say there's a, a beta, say uh, six in front of uh, this uh, crust thing. Right? When we interpret this coefficient six, we say, uh, compared to the baseline Pancroft, right? Think thin crust has six more in terms of uh, people's utility, right? their power tools uh, or rating. Right, uh, so uh, there's a question here. Uh, trash data, the question is very simple. It says uh, trash data, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. Daniel, can, can you please, Explain your question. Oh, okay, um, let, let's move on. So uh, the dummy coding in Excel, uh, that is uh, pretty easy uh, uh, using this if function, if function. Right. So uh, we are going to exercise that in the tutorial, but I, let me quickly show you. Quickly show you, where's my, uh, here. Hmm? Right, so in the Excel worksheet I share, share with you, I have already dummy coded, dummy coded all this pro, uh, profile. Here we have 16 bundles, right? Each bundle has certain features and I have uh, coded these features and these are the X. Remember the equation? Our equation here, right? So the uh, utility is a rating. The table I just uh, coded is X. Is X. Right. So how did I get this X? Right. Let me uh, quickly show you. Right. First, uh, cross the thing. Right. The two, first are two dummies is used to, to represent in a certain bundle uh, what kind of crust we have, right? And we talk about the how to code that, right? So it's a pan crust. We say now uh, this dummy variable cross a thing. 
equal to if the cross of this bundle equals to thing, right? This dummy variable is for thing. So I, it uh, equals to one only if the pizza has a thin crust. In all other cases, it has value zero, right? So uh, this is a pan crust, so should have a zero uh, for cross a thing. Similarly, this one, if the crust is thick, then it's this dummy variable has a value one. In all other cases, it has a value zero. Right? So you should have a zero as well. So now that we have this uh, dummy co coding, we can copy this dummy coding for all 16 bundles. Right? So I, I select these two, go to the right bottom. Uh, when, when my mouse turns into a solid cross, I drag it down. All done. Well done. Let's check it. All right. So for the second bundle, it's a thin crust. So the crust of thin dummy is one. Crust of thick is zero. All right. For the third bundle, it's a thick crust. So crust of thin is zero. Thick is one. So in this way, you you can see that I using this dummy coding, I have turned this tax information into mathematical format. Right. With mathematical format, we can use uh, 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 the regression to deal with it, right? Uh, we have other questions? So uh, another good question. I, I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, you're all thinking very hard. Right? How do you know how many bundles is enough to discover uh, de decisions? Uh, that is a complicated problem. Right? Uh, so I do not have a very simple answer for you. Uh, and uh, this is clearly beyond this course. Uh, um, in con conjoint, uh, there's uh, some design, design tool provided by, uh, for example, SAS. I, I typically use SAS, S-A-S. Right? SAS is a, a very expensive software. <laughs> uh, I, I typically use that to generate those designs. Um, I typically use a tool called orthogonal design, orthogonal de de design. So it minimizes the number of profile we need. At the same time, it can ensure that I am able to estimate the part words for each feature level. You can see this is a very complicated mathematical problem, right? But you don't have to use SAS. For example, the uh, uh, website I give you, the optional website I give you, you can try over there, you tell, uh, tell uh, in that website, you enter how many features and feature levels you want to put in, and they will generate uh, a design for you. All right. uh, but uh, I don't want to open the black box over here. It's way too complex. All right. uh, but you, it's a very good question. When you do contract analysis, when you design it, you need to ensure that your design is efficient. All right. It gives you the ability to estimate all these uh, particles. Good question. Um, so we just uh, turned uh, one column of uh, information into text. And because it has three levels, I use uh, two dummy variables, right? So the same thing, I can use topping, topping here. It has four levels, I, so I use uh, three dummy variables, right? Uh, to save time, I will use my previous formula I just copy it over here. So for these uh, four bundles, you can see now it's all pepperoni, uh, pineapple pizza. For the next four, veggie pizza, right? And then sausage pizza, then pepperoni pizza. Uh, where's my mouse? Uh, then sausage pizza, right? Uh, the same, same thing, I can call it the, the cheese type, the amount and the price type. So I copy all this to here. So with this code, a code table, we turn all this text information into numbers. Into, into numbers. And after we know some people's rating, right? now the, if you uh, put, remember your rating for each one, you can put them here. Right? 
after uh, we get the data, we are going to estimate the part towards the coefficient. Right? Okay, back to my slides. Uh, let's go to one step uh, at a time. All right, so our homework that is included in the tutorial exercise, right? Dummy code the bound uh, bound design. I do it for for you, but you should have the ability to do it yourself. Right? Um, then dummy coded, coded other demographic variables. Dummy, dummy coding is not only useful for conjoint. I, I intentionally put it here because you can also use this technique to deal with your team project. For example, uh, gender, right? race, uh, whether they own a car or not, whether they own a credit card or not, which home city do they stay? This can all, this information can all be incorporated in your analysis. But first, you need to turn those information into a mathematical format. And a dummy variable, dummy coding uh, is a, a one way to do that. So make sure you do, uh, do the homework. Right? So now we are going to estimate the path words. Right? So we to remember this elegant equation. Right. In this case, when we break it down, it, it is like that. Right. So beta zero, that intercept, we have two uh, dummy variables for crust. Right. So this, uh, for this uh, crust feature, we have two, two variables and we have part words for them. Then we have uh, three topping dummy, dummy variable. Right. So topping veggie, topping sausage, topping pepperoni, and each of them have their own part words. Then we have a uh, uh, type of cheese because there are three levels. We have two dumb variables. Swiss, right, mozzarella. So default, the baseline is uh, Old English. Uh, amount of cheese, there's only one dummy variable because two are uh, interested. Right. And the price, we have uh, the fifth feature. We have uh, 9.99 is a baseline and uh, two dummy variables, price 899 and the price 799. Each of them have part words as well. So an uh, example of uh, feeding the model with one data record, uh, that's for one bundle, I have give a rating of 75, right? And with that 75, if we put this back into the equation above, we will have this. Dependent variable is 75, then equals to beta zero. Uh, all the betas are the things we need to estimate. So, uh, because it's pan crust, so this both dummy cross a thing and a cross six should have zero value. Right. Then sausage topping, sausage dot topping, this sausage dummy variable should be one. All other dummy variables are zero. Right. So, mozzarella cheese, mozzarella dummy should be one. All other should be zero. Right. Zero. And a lot of cheese, so a lot of uh, dummy should be, where, uh, should be one. Right. Price 7.99, so that's a dummy variable. Uh, price 7.99 should be one. The other variables to be zero. Right. So after you put it in, uh, it's actually not that long. <laughs> not, not that long. And uh, no, uh, that the uh, one good thing about software, software really don't care how long your equation is, right? It looks complicated to us, but compu to computer, it does not care. Right. Uh, so that re reminds me. The regression was considered a high technique in 1990s, right? Because at that time, we all need to manually calculate <laughs> uh, do the regression. So not a lot of people can do that. Right? But with the uh, information technology nowadays, it's very easy. Right? Uh, so being, uh, it gives a lot of uh, ability to deal with a huge amount of data. Right? Uh, that's why we need marketing analytics more and more nowadays. Uh, so this is a estimation result. Let me uh, quickly try, right? So uh, we are going to use this person as an example. Right? So ratings are here. These are already done. So uh, let me uh, go back to the original, uh, th uh, this worksheet to show you from step one. Right? So I will first uh, paste, paste uh, the ratings over here. I only want to paste a value. Right, so I right click, 
paste a special, only paste the value, right? uh, because I don't want to destroy the nice format I put in. Right? <laughs> I set up an equation here, right? so equals to this cell. So the, uh, here, when I put in the rating, they are automatically copied in this table. So this table is all the data we have. We have the dependent variable, we have the independent variables, right? And now I ask you to do some regression. You should know how to do it, right? So uh, I will first load in the um, adding. I don't know why, but uh, in the in the past, the adding where I loaded our adding it was pretty fast. Uh, nowadays, I don't know which one is wrong. Uh, when I need to load the adding, it's slower and slower. So I typically don't uh, load it uh, until I need to use it. So after I load this adding, I, I will press Control M right, to get to the dialog. Control M. So regression is the thing we need. Multiple linear regression. I click OK. Um, the X range, X range is here, right? Select this part. Y range is here. Right? And column headings included with data, intercept. Yeah, intercept is very important. Right? Uh, later I will ask you, there's a question for you. Uh, in content analysis we are doing, uh, this intercept have a special meaning. I start to think that's about that question. So we make sure you select the intercept, regression analysis, and uh, okay, I will put it in a new worksheet. Click OK. All right. So here's the uh, result. Right. And you will see the result is uh, exactly the same uh, as in our slides. Uh, uh, but before you show other people, you know, it's nice to format this. Right? For example, I have uh, formatted this nicely so that uh, you can easily read the result. Right. It's a good habit for you to do it. Now let's take a look at this regression result. Right? There's a bunch of things we need to check. Yes? Uh, for, what is the first thing? After you get a regression, what is the first thing? Check overall worthwhile, right? Overall was worthwhile. Uh, it's uh, significant. Otherwise, this regression is a garbage one, right? Then, yes, nice, uh, nice response, Daniel. Uh, so uh, then now uh, overall model fit, we look at which one? R square, right? R square has a meaning. It's a percentage of variance that is explained. But just R square is used to compare different models. When you only have one model, you should look at R square. Right. Uh, then you look at the coefficients. Are they significant? Uh, I have a question, question say, can, can we ditch any coefficients that is not significant? That's a good question. Something actually I want to discuss. Uh, but, uh, but first, uh, let's look at uh, uh, the result. P-value, uh, some are significant, some are not significant. And we also need to look at the effect size. Effect size, are they large or small? Right. So now uh, it's time for some discussion. So do you think it's, uh, the regression is a good one? It should be, right? The R square is 98%. It's like a perfect understanding of what these people want about the, the, uh, the PISA, right? But now, uh, then we look at the result, we, we see uh, some insignificant result. Right? And for those insignificant results, for example, this one, zero point uh, across the thing, the value, p-value is insignificant. And uh, coefficient size, well, actually it's not a small one. Right? Even though it's insignificant, it's not a small one. Look at another one, price 7.99. It's not significant, but the effect size is still a large one. So uh, should we drop 
the variables that is insignificant. Remember our discussion in the last session, right? I, we gave people, uh, I gave, gave out reasons why we should, why you should, sometimes you should drop the insignificant variables, sometimes you should not. I think about the reasons. Right? The reason uh, we should not uh, drop, uh, uh, we should drop them when we are exploring them. Right? We don't know if uh, independent var uh, variable is useful or not, so we give it a try. Right. And we found them not significant, so not useful, drop it. But in this case, is that so? Did we just uh, put the uh, product feature to explore or we have a strong reason to believe they're here? Obviously, now we have a reason for them to be here, right? Be here. Uh, it represents a product combination. Moreover, even if it's not significant, another reason we talked about last time, right? even if not significant, uh, significant means whether different from zero or not, right? 629, that's a much, much better uh, estimation of the effect of 799 than zero, right? This is much, a much better guess than zero even though it's insignificant, right? We have a question say, what is, what is effect size? Effect size is how large the coefficient is, right? Most importantly in this case, however, uh, we, uh, let's go back to dummy variable. Let's go back to the dummy variable. So let's say we have uh, three levels, right? We have uh, two dummy variables. So now we say, we decided to drop a dummy variable. We decided to drop the cross the thing. We only have cross the thick, all right? We only have cross the thick. So now when you say, uh, I have a cross a pen, you observe zero here. When you have thin cross, it has a value has a zero here. When it's thick cross, it has a value one. Now the meaning of your dummy variable changed. When you have two dummy variables, the baseline was pan crossed. But now, when you only have one dummy variable thick, your baseline is pan and thin crossed. You assume that the pan crossed and the thin crossed, they are similar, and you are not interested in the difference between these two. You're only interested in how different the thick crossed is compared to pan crossed and thin crossed. So the meaning of dumb variable totally changed. Right? So that is the most important reason why in this case, you should not drop insignificant, insignificant variable. But why do, do, you, uh, do we see such a high uh, R square, but uh, no, uh, some la large coefficient, but insignificant? It is mainly because of the data point we have for each person. So remember, we have for each one, we have 16 data points, right? Each one just did 16 ratings of, of PISA. And we are trying to estimate how many coefficients over here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. We try to estimate <laughs> 11 coefficients using 16 data point. Right? That is uh, not uh, the legitimate way to do regression. Right? As a guideline, when you do regression for each coefficient you want to estimate, you should have at least uh, five to 10 data points. You should have at least uh, five to 10 data point for each coefficient that you are interested in estimating, right? So when you have very small data point, you, it's quite typical to see you now super high R square or super low R square. It's equally possible, 
Right? It's also natural to see a large coefficient with insignificant p-value. Right? So when you really want to have a solid estimation of the coefficient, what we typically do is we pulling out, pulling together different people's rating together. For example, we have uh, we did this uh, uh, study right? among all you guys. We have uh, 100 people here, let's say. Right? Each people gave me 16 answers. Then together I have uh, 1,600 answers. I use all these data points together and run this reg regression. Then I will have a much solid estimation of all these coefficients. Right. So uh, that is a legitimate way to do that. But now if we have to uh, do the estimation for this one person, which was also doable just as what we did, right? It's just so you will see uh, super high or low R square and insignificant uh, uh, variables, unstable predictions. Uh, if you don't care all of this, that's fine. You can still get an estimation and you, you will see that precision is actually not too bad. Uh, uh, that's because the content analysis does have, uh, 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 it, it is a very powerful tool. Right? Uh, but when you pull multiple together, you're making additional example. I need to let you know that. So the assumption you make is that the people you choose to pull together, you assume they are, they are similar. They share the same set of coefficient. That is the assumption you make. So in reality, you know, if you assume the entire population shares the same set of patterns, you can pull all, everyone together. If you think there's a, uh, multiple segments of customer. See, uh, we are going to, uh, we, we start to look at the difference other, among customer, right? So if you believe these 50 people belongs to segment one, these 50 people belong to segment two, then you can pull the first 50 together, uh, people together and estimate their part was for segment one. You can also pull the second 50 people together and estimate the part was for segment two. That's how we get the Seg segment level uh, estimation of passwords. See? Uh, so understanding the problem makes us you now uh, to have a, uh, seeing the, all these problems here uh, helps us think about this problem further right? and uh, how to implement, implement that in the real world. Another question. Uh, Uh, say, you no. Know, when we design this product, we uh, should have a reason to believe the variable should be there. That is right. right? And uh, in this particular uh, case, as I said, the most important here is if you re remove some variable, the meaning of the baseline will be different. Right? That's a primary reason we should not drop. Right? And after all, no, this surprise, although this is not significant, right? So 6.25 is much better guess than zero. All right. So uh, with that, uh, we are going to use part words, right? But first, uh, let's look at those. I just uh, copy, I just uh, copy this coefficient from a column to a row, right? To a row. So intercept is nine. 91.25, then we have coefficient for each of them. Some question for you. Which cross is a participant's favorite? Which cross is a participant's favorite? We are just talking about this person. We only use this person called, uh, this person is A01, right? A0, A01. We just use this person's data. Which crust is a participant's favorite? Is it a thin crust, C crust? No, right. it is a baseline, pan crust. Because compared to, remember, compared to the baseline pan crust, the thin crust has a utility that is minus 1.875. That means compared to the baseline, the utility of thin is 
1.87 lower than the baseline. The C cross is even lower, 16.25 lower than the baseline, right? So crust, uh, pan crust is the uh, most of favorite. So which cheese is a uh, participant's favorite? The baseline, never forget the baseline. The baseline, all the English, right? By baseline, it has a value zero, right? So Swiss is 5.6 higher, right? Mozzarella is three, uh, 0.75 higher. So which was the best? Swiss, right? Uh, which feature, now, now we talk about feature instead of feature level, right? Which feature is the most important to this participant? Uh, this is a, um, a further step, right? So we know, we know the fe uh, feature level part was, now we try to decide which feature is most important. Right? So what do you think? Um, Shall we define the importance of feature? In conjoint, we define the importance of a feature is where the range, where the range of feature level patterns is the largest. For example, now never forget the baseline. Right? For example, the crust of the baseline, the highest is zero. The lowest is minus 16.25. So the difference, the range, that is the difference between the lowest and the highest is 16.25. That is the highest is zero, lowest is minus 16, right? So it's my, the range of 16. Topping, the lowest is minus 91. Right? The veg topping, uh, I guess this guy does not uh, like uh, uh, veggie. <laughs> the highest is the baseline, pineapple, right? So all three dummy variables have negative ratings. So the baseline zero is the highest. So the range for topping is 91.25. The same, you can calculate the range for a type of cheese, amount of cheese, and uh, actually amount of cheese does not matter. Right? Uh, pri price, price the highest is 62.25. The lowest is minus 0.625. So range is six. Uh, this one minus this one, the difference is 6.875. So among all these, the widest range is topping. Right? So uh, the most important feature is topping. What does that mean in managerial uh, language? What does range mean? Here range is when you decide a product, you can choose among all these possible toppings, right? You may choose the right topping, you may choose the wrong topping. Right? So the biggest difference, you might make the right choice in topping against the worst topping. That is a possible utility difference you can make by making a good decision compared to making a bad decision. That is a possible cost for your mistake or your possible gain for making the right decision in that one. So among all these features, the least feature you want to make a mistake in is rain, is this topping. Because if you make a uh, mistake and gave this person a veg topping, well, the, the part was will be uh, will drop dramatically, right? On the contrary, if you get the topping right, if you get the topping right compared to other toppings, you are go going to have a lot higher utility if you design the feature right. So in that way, we design, uh, we say we define the most important feature is the one you want. You definitely don't want to make mistake. Right. or you definitely want to make it right. That's the managerial language. Um, so you should start to develop your ability to trans transfer those uh, numbers into insights, transfer your readings of numbers into managerial language. And this is an example here. Right. So now, uh, 
yeah, so the answer is topping. So now I'd like to, you to think about the intercept. What does intercept mean here? I, I get, ask you this question. Uh, intercept has a special meaning. What is a, that special meaning? To answer that question, let's go back to look at this equation, right? Go back to look at this equation. Intercept here is beta zero, right? When does the utility equal to beta zero? That is, when all these x dummy variables, they're zero, right? Yes, when all these are zero, the utility equals to beta zero. So in that way, you know, beta zero, beta zero is the utility people would have for a pizza with all the baseline features, with all the baseline features. In our Excel file, you can find bundle one is indeed such a case. All the utility, uh, all, all the independent variable, now uh, dummy variables, they are zero. Right? That means a pizza with all the baseline features. Right? And the uh, estimated utility is when well, everything is uh, zero, right? You can wipe all these uh, things out and the intercept is left. For that baseline pizza, a pizza with all baseline features, utility for this person is 91.25. Um, another interesting thing, look at this result. Here now the, um, Price, 8.99 is a negative value. Right? You know the baseline is 9.99, right? So when the baseline 9.99 is zero, uh, you charge, charge this person $1 less. Actually, the utility is a negative number. Does that make sense to you? Is it some sort of mistake? Is that we did something wrong? Uh, because we have don't have enough samples, etc. Does the result have face value, or no? On the fa face level, does it make sense to you? Right. Uh, it is possible. Right. It is pos uh, possible uh, for a lot of reasons. Because we we are human being. Right. The person who gave you the answer, they are hu human being. They can they can be. Uh, not completely rational, right? So sometimes, for, for a good example is uh, not pizza, it's actually wine, right? Why? People, um, if you want to go to a good friend's house, right? You want to bring a good bottle of wine, uh, then you, to, uh, you cho choose wine. Not a lot of us know what is a good wine, what is not a good wine. So in that case, what do you do? You buy expensive wine. Why do you buy expensive wine? Because you want to pay more? No, I don't want to pay more. I'm just not sure about the quality. And uh, now all this marketing effort gave me a hint, me, uh, to, uh, to give me an impression that uh, a better, higher price usually means better quality. Right? So I'm not looking for a high price, but I'm looking for <laughs> high quality. All right. So people may have that handover <laughs> uh, when they buy pizza as well. Somehow uh, may pay more, one more dollar, may psychologically make them think, you know, I actually uh, getting a better pizza. Right? That's completely possible. Right? And this is the estimated result. Now, if you ask, uh, ask people, all other features are the same, would you like to pay $8.99 or $19.99? Of course, they want to pay less, right? So you will not see that. But remember, this result are estimated from all respondents. Right? The, 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 all the re result cannot be super consistent. And by the way, there's only a small difference, right? It's minus 0.6 or something compared to like minus 91. It's virtually nothing. Right? So it's okay to observe. Sometimes we have a weird result and it's uh, completely natural. Right? Completely natural. If we have a big, big, huge unexpected sign, then we need to think about where we did wrong. Right? 
All right, so uh, with all these uh, uh, part words, uh, I'm gonna ask, uh, answer this question a bit later because we are uh, short in time. Right. So uh, we are going, to, next step, we are going to use this uh, part words to predict utility, right? So here we have uh, this part words, right? Uh, we have the, the, this part was estimated and we have uh, four pizza. That is the four pizza I asked you to choose at the very beginning. Right? I have already coded the dummy codism, turned them into mathematical numbers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the utility for each pizza using the part words. Right? So you are familiar with regression now. Right? So what we try to do here is uh, the beta zero plus the, part, the first beta times the first X plus the second beta times the second, right? So we keep on doing that for all of them and get a utility. Right? So in Excel, we have uh, some other uh, function uh, to, for me to do the easier. Right? So first I will do uh, intercept plus some product. Some product is multiplied to arrays. Uh, this beta array and the x array, right? We can calculate that, uh, uh, 94.38. I can calculate the same for other ones. Uh, if you directly copy it down, you will see zero because when you move it down, the part was part also moved down. I don't want that to happen. So in the equation, I need to lock the part was part. So, where I, so that when I copy the equation, this part will not move. Right? To lock the equation, I, you can use uh, the dollar sign to lock it. Right? So I put a dollar sign over here, column, lot of both column and the row. Right? In this uh, red part, this part, I can also lock them by adding dollar sign to all the columns and rows. But you can also do that by pressing F4 on your keyboard. When you press F4 once, it's both columns and rows are locked. You press another time, only rows are locked. Columns are not locked. Right? Then press another time, column lock, row not. Press another time, nothing locked. Right? So you only press once, press enter. Now you copy, copy the equation down. The equation copy down correctly. Among four of these, I predict that the one with the highest utility will got picked by this person. And from data, right? I, I collect uh, um, 12 people data here, right? And from the da data, this person, A1, 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 indeed choose pizza one, indeed choose pizza one. So we could get a right prediction over here. Sometimes you will get a wrong prediction, like two, I copy over here, R18 and Z77. Both people, we did the wrong prediction here, but you will find the utility that is actually chosen, 60 in this case, and our prediction is very close. Right. And the other one are the same. So uh, the chosen and our prediction is very close. And that again is totally possible. Right. Think about when you buy pizza. Even if I like one pizza best, are you going to buy it every time? No. Right. It's called a variety seeking. That's in marketing theory, right? Variety seeking. People have the intention that sometimes no, no, to change something does not have to be my lifetime favorite, right? Sometimes I need to, I want to have something different. That has some utility as well, right? So it's perfectly normal to find someone, even if you, uh, the, you absolutely estimate their preference correctly, it's still possible that you observe they choose something that is not so perfect, right? that is completely natural as well. We are talking about the real behavior now, right? We're not talking about the synthetic data, this real behavior we are talking about. Right? So homework, make sure you estimate the passwords yourself. Now, uh, try your own data, right? see if uh, your uh, data can predict your choice. Right? So I already, did this discussion, All right. uh, the first one. Second one, now uh, how to model possible com combinations as sausage topping goes best with Swiss cheese. 
how do you do that? Right. We actually talked about that uh, tool in the last session. Right. It's called interaction. Right. You can use the interaction between interaction term between the sausage topping and the sausage cheese um, to model that. Right. If you're interested, give it a try. Right. How to model continuous variable, for example, continuous price. Um, simple, just replace the dummy variable with a continuous variable. Right. All right, so lastly, it's about how we are, we are going to use the contract out output. As you can see, uh, the output we get is a numerical estimation of the relative importance or passwords of all feature, feature levels, right? Uh, for password for feature levels and importance for all features, we can calculate that, right? And using that, we can estimate the utility uh, to a person given any sort of offering. So you can easily use, remember we talk about easily and systematically measure people's preference, right? Easily use that by providing any sort of pizza as long as you uh, code them into numerical form, you can calculate their utility. Right? And think about that uh, ev even more. If you not only have this pizza, but all your competitors pizza, right? Then you can find out how many people will like your pizza, how many people will like your competitor pizza. Then you can, can calculate what? Right? You can calculate, uh, for example, market share, right? And this gives you ability to simulate your market decision before you actually doing it in the market. Uh, you can create an environment in a virtual, in your computer, right? In a virtual environment, if I design a certain new product, how much market share am I going to get? If I know the cost and the profit information, I can calculate how much profit I'm going to, use, going to get, right? Is that wonderful? You don't have to actually make this piece, piece and launch it uh, on the market. You can just uh, uh, simulate that in the uh, virtual environment, right? So that's a one beautiful implementation of contract analysis. All right, so this is uh, what, what I promised you. Now some uh, uh, choice based conjoint examples I give you. Right. Um, and uh, to do choice based conjoint, you need a multinomial logistic regression. It's optional. You can follow this link to learn it yourself. So that's all for today. Uh, I have some homework slides for you and uh, uh, next week we are going to talk about the customer value. We are going to talk about harvest value from customers. Right. Sorry for the overtime and uh, we will stop here. I, I still have uh, uh, one or two questions. I will uh, turn off the recording and answer uh, the, the questions. Uh, for, the, for, those who, uh, for those who will leave, I will see you next week. Bye now. Uh, stop recording.